It doesn't happen twice in the life of a referee that the Prime Minister wants to murder. You'd hope it happens no times, zero times, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite unusual, wasn't it? And uh, you know, I'm sure that that was, that was said in the heat of the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I understood the reaction. How do you feel in United Europe, represented by a man who uh, wanted to murder you once, Mr. Donald Tusk? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's good to be back in, in Poland. Um, I guess the first time I came, came back here after that famous game in 2008 was for the Euros in 2012, four years later. And um, yeah, I guess I was a little bit apprehensive back then. Um, my mum was even more than apprehensive. She was a little bit afraid about me coming to Poland. She told you not to, not to come to you. She kind of like said, are you sure you're going to be safe? And I uh, said, I'm, well, I think I will be. But uh, well, I came back in 2012, spent four weeks here in, in this, um, this fantastic city and, and was made to feel really welcome. Probably had the, the most enjoyable tournament of my entire career that summer in 2012. Going back to this uh, 2008 decision of a penalty that uh, prompt our then Prime Minister to say he would <laughs> be eager to murder you. I think it happened, it doesn't happen twice in the life of a referee that the Prime Minister wants to murder you. You'd hope it happens no times, zero times, but uh, yeah, it's, it's quite unusual, wasn't it? And uh, you know, I'm sure that that was, that was said in the heat of the moment. Um, but yeah, I, I understood the reaction, you know, I, I understand. He's, he's an avid fan. Yeah, yeah. yeah. For, Poland is like England. People are football crazy here, aren't they? So a decision like that, where you know you can, you can taste victory. You know, you're two minutes away from winning an important game in a in a tournament that you've you've worked hard to qualify for for two years. Suddenly, in the eyes of the fans, it's snatched away by this controversial decision. And, and I guess it was controversial because it was the type of situation that often you don't see referees penalised either because they don't see it or they feel it's not enough. But you know, we'd been told before the tournament to be strong on certain things and holding in the penalty area was one of those things. And, and UEFA said, look, don't give crazy calls. Don't give it for like a really small, tiny little, but you know, be, be proactive, make it credible by warning players if you see it's happening. And, and that's what happened in the last, this last minute. And then I was really focused on that and I could see it was Sebastian Prodel of Austria who was pulled to the floor. Yeah, and I, yeah, could yeah. See his, I could see his white shirt underneath, his, his, his match shirt was pulled away and I could see his white shirt underneath and it just, it really caught my eye quite strongly. And instinctively I thought, yeah, that's a clear holding offence, blew the whistle and pointed. Um, Are you aware that Polish team then led by Leo Van Hakker, they, they haven't watched the uh, DVD with guidelines because they missed it somewhere. I wasn't I aware of that. I mean, that, that, that was such a positive thing at, at more recent tournaments that all the competing teams would, would be visited by somebody from the referee committee um, who would say, look, these are the points that of emphasis. These are the points that we are telling our referees to be strong on. And, and we saw in, for example, in 2012, the tournament here that, you know, the behavior of the players was excellent, really excellent. Actually, the, the match that we're talking about featured one wrong decision, but it was a uh, wrongly allowed goal, goal for Poland. First of all, you're right, there was a, a goal scored earlier by uh, Roger, Roger, Roger Guerrero. <laughs> yeah, the, the Brazilian who yeah. became a, po a Polish, Polish guy. guy. We used all means to. <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Hey, why, why not? You know, other countries do that as well. Um, so Roger scored um, for Poland and, and the, we saw later the, the goal was offside. And, and I think my assistant on that side, if anybody's seen the documentary that was made about that tournament that followed the lives of the, the referees, they'll, they'll hear the doubt in his voice. He's asking at half time, did I get it right? He knew it was a close one. It was a quite a complicated situation. The movement of the goalkeeper, the movement of, of Roger as well. Um, and he was in a bad position and he, he didn't call offside. And when we see it back, it was offside, but we didn't know that at the time the assistant suspected it might be. So if anybody thinks, well, he gave the penalty to, to, to balance things up, that's certainly not the case. I, I really don't want people to, to, to think that that was the case. It, it, it absolutely was not. Yeah, you seem relaxed now about it, but uh, actually you received many death threats. There was a bomb alarm in the stadium where you were refereeing next. Uh, I read in your book uh, that uh, the chief of police, was it in Salzburg that you came to the said, we won't let them kill you here. <laughs> no, 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 I'm smiling, it's not, it's not a laughing matter, but we flew back to our base in Zurich 
uh, and I'm at the airport waiting for my bag to, to arrive and I turn my mobile telephone back on after the flight and I'd got a message from uh, a, a senior police officer back in England uh, in the region where I lived and and, and where you were so, yourself yeah, police yeah. and I was yeah, I knew the guy because I was a policeman myself and uh, I just started a five-year career break a sabbatical to concentrate on refereeing but I was still heavily connected to the police and I spoke to him and he explained about these death threats that had appeared on the internet and uh, as a result of those they were going to take it seriously and put a police guard around the house and uh, we talked about putting cameras up at the house back in, in England and and also the security measures in the in the hotel uh, in Zurich and I thought we maybe wouldn't get a second game because of all the all the talk and the controversy but I was supported by UEFA they gave me a second game in Salzburg between Greece and Spain and as we landed at the airport, the head of the police met me there and said, "Welcome to Salzburg. We won't let them kill you here." Uh, and that was that was nice to hear. But uh, but yeah, of course, we're talking about a really small minority of people who reacted in this way, and there was thousands but of fans in the stadium these, and watching I mean, on TV who never reacted. Yeah. We had precedents. I mean, uh, those huge footballing occasions ended the careers of Anders Frisk, of Urs Meyer, and with Urs Meyer, it was like really full blown. Hate campaign. Exactly, it was even worse, wasn't it? That was in 2004 in the Euros. Urs Meyer suffered a, a, a lot at the hands of the English supporters in 2004 when he disallowed an England goal against Portugal. Um, and Anders Frisk decided to finish early as well. So, of course, you know, may, maybe if this would have happened later in my career when I was getting close to finishing, maybe it would have been the end of my career. But I was, I was hungry and determined at the time. I was the youngest in the group. I was referee number 12 out of the 12 guys that were there and many were more experienced than I was and who's the worst in this football milieu the, the players always pretending that they are innocent I don't know managers putting pressure media social media other referees the players are pretty good actually I've got to say the players within the match they will try to get an advantage for their team you know and they will try try to achieve their objective of winning the goal in some cases by whatever means but Generally speaking, once the game is finished, you move on to the next one, they're fine. There'll be a handshake at the start of the next game and you know they don't often think back to what's happened previously. Coaches do more often than players. They can all, this is really the case, they can all be they can all be difficult, really. They can all have the moments when the nicest guys off the pitch can become really difficult in that environment. Yeah, you, stand, you sent uh, Pep Guardiola to stands. I did. I mean, yeah. Pep, 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 Pep would appear to be this calm and collected individual, very talented in his role and very successful. Um, but uh, my first and only visit to the uh, to the new camp in Barcelona was for a Champions League quarter final against Bayern Munich, and and I I I caution Lionel Messi for diving for simulation. And you know, people who know football know that any player can any player can dive. But one of the least likely to dive is Lionel Messi. Lionel takes some punishment on the pitch from defenders and he stays on his feet. And I was quite young and naive. You took and, a bat. Yeah, <laughs> and, and maybe, maybe he, he exaggerated a little bit the contact, but when I watch it back, it's more a penalty than a, than a dive. And, and I, I saw it as a dive and cautioned him and, and Guardiola went crazy on the sidelines. And... Um, <laughs> Yeah, so I've I've already made a you know a situation uh, pretty bad by cautioning Lionel Messi when it probably wasn't a dive, and then I have to then go over and put Pep Guardiola into the Tribune because the fourth official saying the saint of football exactly the behaviour is is way out of the level of acceptability, and uh, and I never went back to the new camp ever again. Many of these situation could have easily been avoided with if the referees got a helping hand from uh, technology. Now you are uh, appointed in the US as a man responsible for the uh, uh, VAR system, which is like a video referee, video refereeing. Uh, why we waited so long for it to happen? Even for the referees becoming professional? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question, isn't it? I think, I think one of the reasons why it's taken so long is because it's, it's quite a complicated project it's, it's not straightforward I'm finding that out now in my role in the United States uh, along with all the people that are doing a similar job in the countries that have that have signed up for the for the experiment with the International FA board and FIFA um, football has different qualities to many other sports um, in that it it continues to flow quite often there's a high tempo and there's an awful lot of subjectivity within the game so a lot of situations are not Factual, they are down to the interpretation of a match official or 
the, the view of the observer, of the... the, the Actually, Actually, your situation with Mariusz Lewandowski and Sebastian Kruel wouldn't be uh, like uh, solved by video references. No, was, it was due to interpretation. Exactly, but for sure. This situation would be one that the video assistant referee would not intervene upon. Um, I don't think that, certainly having given the penalty, the VAR would not say that is clearly and obviously wrong. And if the penalty is not given, I, I don't think the video assistant referee would come in and say you have to give a penalty in this situation. Um, we're asking our video assistants to, to only intervene when it's really clear and obvious. And the difficulty for the video referee is to decide what is clear and obvious. They can't ask everybody. They have to make a decision themselves. So we can sit in a room of 10 people who know football, we'll show them a handball situation, and sometimes the room can be split five, five. Five people think clear handball, five think not. So do we want the video assistant to get involved in those situations? No, we don't. But what it will do, it will, it will avoid us making those really clear errors. You know, like the ones that we can remember, such as Thierry Henry, handling the ball for France against Ireland in the, in the World Cup playoff. And actually ruining uh, Martin Hansen's and career really, as really the referee. ruining Martin Hansen's Martin. career. Uh, okay, people can say, well, Martin should have seen it. It was really difficult to see. And so the referee nowadays sits on a ticking bomb, actually, more than... Yeah, yeah. and it, it, got, it got to the stage where our guys were being trained as well as they possibly could. The, the, you know, the officials for 2010 World Cup, they went through a two-year programme of preparation with sports psychologists and sports scientists and expert physical trainers. And we had lots of technical advice and we, we engaged in seminars around the world and we engaged in online training. You know, we're at a level where we've taken the training to, to a place where it can't get much better and still mistakes were made. You know, we saw Carlos Tevez in the World Cup 2010 score a goal for Argentina. He was a long way offside against Mexico. These can be solved in, in a few seconds with video referees. And, and that's why, you know, I'm certainly a supporter of the experiment. It's going to be used in 2018 World Cup in Russia. We'll see how it goes. And then the International FA Board will make a decision in 2018 or 19 about the, the direction forward. They'll make an uh, assessment of how the experiment has gone. Last question is about uh, Shimon Marciniak. Uh, I know that you guys know each other well and uh, uh, as, uh, as far as we know, like each other. <laughs> Do you think he's the referee that can be awarded a World Cup final or Euro final someday? 100%. I got a smile on my face when you mentioned Simon's name because I like Simon a lot. He's got a great attitude as a human being. Uh, he's also a very talented referee and um, I recognised this some time ago, I was, I was on the UEFA elite list and uh, Seaman joined that, uh, that group and uh, we spent a lot of time together. Um, I'm proud to know him, I'm proud of the progress that he's made, I hope the Polish football public are, are proud of him as well. He's already one of the world's greatest referees at the, at the current time and he's got the potential to get even better and to achieve greater things. Um, I'm sure that he will. He's also a bit of like bodybuilder referee. Like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I, I think sometimes to get the respect of the players, sometimes to have credibility and for players to believe you, you need to look uh, like you belong on the field. I think also you need to sell your, your decisions with strong body language and have a strong personality on the field. So I think Seaman has those things. We've already seen him be appointed to some really high-level games, including Champions League semi-finals, and uh, and is going to the um, he went to the Euros last time, had a successful time in France. Yeah. So his final will come. I'm <laughs> pretty <laughs> sure. <laughs> yes, a few finals. I'm pretty world. sure that it will see him uh, at least doing one major final, be it Champions League, Euros, or World Cup, and it will be a great day for me when that happens. A great day for Polish football as well.